Welcome everyone to the Got Book Show. I'm your host, Tim Ward. On the show today, again, we have Dave Lane of Evolve Publishing. Welcome, Dave. Hi, Tim. Glad to be here again. Yes. Well, we have a lot to talk to you about, so we appreciate you making time. You're a smart guy, and we appreciate your wisdom. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks. We uh, Today's topic is going to be, forgive me, Alex, your psychological thriller, one of okay. my favorites in the genre. So okay. I wanted to introduce this book to our audience and let you essentially just share share the screen and, and talk to us about it. So my first question is, let's talk about thrillers. Uh, do you have a favorite thriller author? And if so, what qualities give them that distinction? Uh, I don't think I can pick just one. Um, there have been so many over the years. I will tell you that I, I probably started with Stephen King, Dean Koontz. Um, I also I had a real love affair with the spy thrillers. Um, when I was really getting heavily involved in reading, 1979 to 19, well, 1979 and beyond. It was still in the old Cold War days before the fall of the Soviet Union and all the Eastern Bloc. And I was a big Robert Ludlum fan, probably most famous because of the movies for the Jason Bourne series, movies that have almost nothing to do with the books, by the way. Um, but I also loved Frederick Forsyth, John le Carre, later uh, Tom Clancy and his Jack Ryan series, uh, really good stuff. So... And there have been others since then, everybody from uh, Harlan Coben to Lee Child to John Sanford to David Baldacci. I've tried to read almost everything I could get my hands on at some point, see who I really liked. Uh, and there's so much good thrillers, so many good thrillers out there. So kind of hard to pick just one, impossible really. And now I have the added benefit of having some evolved publishing authors who are writing thrillers and doing a really, really good job of it. So I've become a, a fan of some of our own authors. Who are some of the thrillers that you're excited about right now in the evolved catalog? Well, I think uh, Scott Schinberg's Michelle Reagan series is a is a whole lot of fun. Um, I love DM Early's uh, Call of Destiny series. He's got two books out so far, The Temptation of Destiny and The Pyres of Destiny. I had the pleasure of editing those as well, and they're, they're a whole lot of fun. Um, I think that uh, J.P. Barnett's Lore Stalker series uh, has been successful for a reason. Um, and those aren't what you would call, you know, breakneck thrillers, but they, they kind of cross into that genre. It's a bit of a, this series is a bit of a genre bender, but I think they, they also qualify as thrillers. Um, I like them all, and I, I haven't had the opportunity to read all of the Evolve Publishing thrillers yet. My schedule is just a little too busy. I read the ones that I that I edit, of course. But the others I'm having to pick through as I as I have time. So um, everything that's in our crime category tends to cross over into the thriller. Everything that's in our horror category can easily cross into thriller. Um, your own book, God's Knife Revolt, is what that's a bit of a genre bender. I think it crosses into three or four different genres. We could say uh, everything from urban fantasy to uh, to horror to uh, suspense thriller. Um, as always, we're careful at Evolve Publishing about which ones we bring on board. So I I like them all. It's hard for me to single any particular ones out, but um, you can go to the Evolve Publishing website and click on that genres thriller suspense and you're going to find plenty to choose from good stuff so take us back in time to when you started writing forgive me alex you're reading uh well 
I guess tell me because I don't I don't know when did you start writing Forgive Me Alex? What was? Um, I believe it was 1923. No, um, <laughs> seems seems like I, I did. Seems like I did a lot of training and preparation for that and that it took me about 20 years. So my foray into writing, I thought I would write a spy thriller back in the day. And I realized probably halfway through that I, I just didn't possess the knowledge that I needed. And I had to do a lot more research that I either didn't have the time or the access to. I was stationed overseas in the military at the time, and uh, this was pre-internet days. So uh, it just proved a little too difficult. Then I tried my hand at a, at a horror novel, actually got through it, finished it, set it aside for a while, looked at it later, realized that it was absolutely terrible and a little embarrassing. And I really set it aside at that point. I just... It, it had to go away, but it was a great learning process for me. And um, then I got busy, you know, I, my career, my job, my day job, I, I was working 70, sometimes 80 hours a week and finding time to pursue that writing proved uh, difficult. And so I ended up coming to it quite a lot later in my mid forties. And once I sat down to do it, and said, okay, this is it. I'm going to devote myself to it. It actually only took me 11 weeks to write and then three years to revise. <laughs> so that's, I was a little bit uh, crazy about trying to make certain, certain parts of it as perfect as I could. No such thing, but I tried to get close. It has some moving parts. So There's one area I wanted to, to talk to you about. First, I'm curious, what, what made the change? How did you go from, I'm not going to write this, it's set aside to, I'm doing this? Was there a character? Was there a setting, a scene? Well, first of all, there was a, a life event that made it, I, I want to say, not just possible, but almost mandatory that I do this. Uh, I had suffered a, a head injury, my eighth concussion, uh, back in the early 2000s, and it it did a number on my head. I had post-concussion syndrome and for about three, four years, I was almost non-functional. So really, it really caused a big turn in my life, a big change. At the time, I wasn't even sure I would recover. Doctors couldn't really tell me. They didn't know a lot about post-concussion syndrome in those days. They know more about it now, but uh, almost 20 years ago, it was still quite a mystery to them. And the brain is really the final frontier when it comes to medicine. Still, there's a lot they don't know. Um, I did recover finally, <laughs> and uh, but by now I, you know, by that time, I had my whole life was turned upside down. I'd lost everything I owned, lost my job, lost everything, my house, my car. I had. I woke up one day, I had 38 cents to my name. That's that's a motivator. So wow. I sat down to write because it seemed the right possibility for me to have a future again. So I was really devoted to it at that point. I was, I, I was still only able to stay awake, you know, maybe seven or eight hours a day at that time. Um, it wasn't that I was lazy and sleeping. It's just, I just passed out. I mean, my head would just knock me out. So... But 11 weeks, and um, and I felt pretty good about it, but I knew that it needed a lot of polish, and I did shop it around to agents at the time, got all the usual form rejections. Um, over the course of a couple of years, I made a number of improvements to it. I think it got much, much better. I know it got much, much better, and if I needed evidence of that, outside of my own subjective opinion, because it's very hard for us to be objective about our own work. Um, it was getting finally first one and then two and ultimately four positive rejections from literary, literary agents who took the time to, you know, write a paragraph or two about how much they liked the book and the characters. 
And so there were other market reasons that they didn't accept it. But that told me that I was on the right track. I still made a few improvements even after that, uh, prior to going to publication with it in 2011. So it was a, it was about a, a four year process from start to finish. You mentioned on a prior episode, <laughs> starting out a book, kicking someone in the teeth. Is that part of the improvement process that you had for this? And what, how does how does this book start with kicking the reader in the teeth? Well, the the it opens with two very short lines. I never expected to be a killer. Who does? So, I always hoped that that would be intriguing enough to plant that hook. You know, you want to like when you're out mm -hmm. fishing, you want to plant that hook in the reader. You want the reader to say, "Okay, now see, this is something I might want to read." Um, and I think it, it's very important to do that early. So I, I focused on that. The opening uh, 12, 13 lines, the opening segment is set in what is current time for, for, my, for that book, 1995, and sets the stage that here's a guy who's got some issues. There's some things going on in his life. Then it flashes back 20 years to the first really pivotal event that started this transformation that he underwent. And then it comes back to, to 1995 again, 20 years back, and really sets up at that point the rest of the story. So I think, I hope that the entire first chapter just holds on tight and doesn't let go. That was my intention. Um, I just wanted the reader to be so invested that they couldn't stop. You know, that's that's what you try to achieve. And I agree. I thought that first chapter was great. Uh, your line about no one expects to be a killer. Sorry if I didn't quote it exact, but I agree. It puts you in his shoes. I don't expect to be a killer. That's not my plan for today. So right. I'm picking up this book and this guy says, well, I didn't expect to. And I'm thinking, yeah, me neither. So what's going to happen? And then that first chapter, it has a spoiler. So I won't uh, cover that. But it is an emotional hook that I found um, startling even. It's a, it's a shocker to start the book. Well, you know, it's um, I set out to write a psychological thriller. And when you use that word psychological, what you're really implying is that you're going to dig deep into the minds of the characters, but you're also going to force the reader to dig deep into those minds and perhaps into their own mind as they try to empathize or relate with these characters in some way, or perhaps just really develop a visceral hatred for them. For example, in the case of my bad guy, um, I've had readers say that, wow, I got to a point where I just thought if I ever see this guy, I'll shoot him. <laughs> so that's good. That's the precisely the sort of feeling I hoped to generate. And it's really the reason I wrote it in the first person narrative, because I wanted to be in those characters' minds all the time in a close way that I didn't think I could perhaps quite achieve in the third person. Now that I've done the first book and I'm working on the second book, which is going to be finished, I hope, before the apocalypse. Uh, Here's for that. Um, <laughs> I've switched over to, you know, sort of a standard third person past tense uh, narrative, but I felt that it was really necessary to get as close as possible to those characters in that first book to create that emotional impact. And um, I worked at that really, really hard. So I, I hope it works. <laughs> Could we talk about some of those characters? Could you, some of the main characters set us up, what is their life like when we meet them? And then what's, how is that sort of helpful or setting the stage for that psychological arc that you're planning for them 
We could start with Tony if you want. Sure. Tony Hooper, the protagonist, uh, the good guy in the story, is not all good. He's got plenty of faults. Um, he, I wanted to paint the picture of a guy who was essentially really a good guy, but who experienced some things that sent, set him onto a darker path. And the question I asked myself at the beginning is what would happen to your, you know, normal, everyday, average, all American Joe if something happened that just really destroyed everything around him and everything he knew? Um, what would happen to that person? What, what changes would that person undergo? What possibilities might he consider that he would never have considered before? I mean, it wouldn't have even been anything he would dream of. And so Tony is that guy. And he starts out in the story um, primarily at the age of 18. There's a, a small section when he's 15 that is part of the setup, but that's just part of that initial setup. Then he's 18 years old. And for the other part of the story, because it bounces back and forth between these two time frames, he's uh, 38. Or 35, I'm sorry, he's 35, it's 17 years later. And um, what everything that he's experiencing in 1995 at the age of 35 has been set in motion by events that occurred to him primarily when he was 18 years old in 1978. And I hint had some things that happened in his life after that in the book, particularly at the end of the book that I don't really get into, but I plan to get into. It's part of my outline for future installments of the Tony Hooper series. On the flip side, the bad guy, Mitchell Norton, um, he's kind of... Uh, <sighs> How do I describe this guy? He's mostly a regular guy who also undergoes a transformation for different reasons. But he's inclined to think differently just in terms of his personality and his mental processes than, for example, Tony Hooper is. Tony Hooper is, at his core, essentially... A a good and decent guy who doesn't always do good and decent things, but that's because of what happens to him. Mitchell Norton, on the other hand, is able to be tipped into doing some really vile, terrible things. I think because he's just more inclined to that naturally. It's There's something inside of him that even makes that possible. You know, you might, as a reader, read that and say, well, I would never make those kinds of choices. I hope that's true. <laughs> but uh, Mitchell does make some really, really bad, evil choices. Um, I think that that seed of evil is within him already. And this thing that transforms him, I won't spoil it, but um, it only works to spoil or to change him because he's he's open and inclined to that kind of change anyways. So that's what I tried to capture. There's a little bit of romance in this too. It's a, it's a heartfelt journey for Tony. Yeah. Some of that's a bit of a spoiler. So is there anything that you want to share about any of the other female characters? Well, there are a couple of uh, critical female characters, one in Tony's life when he's 18 years old, and the initial events occur that throw his life into complete turmoil. And another one when he's 35 years old, and his life is returning to that old turmoil uh, because of what's happening at that stage. And so, you know, we are we're human. We engage in relationships. It's a natural part of things. 
and it's a natural part of Tony's life. He is, despite his avocation, if we can put it that way, not really his job, although he sometimes thinks of it that way. Despite his unusual avocation, um, he's, you know, he's trying to live a life. He's trying to to be as normal as he can be, and that includes some relationships. Now, at the age of 18, when all that early stuff happens, that's just the normal, you know, he's a senior in high school and has a big romance and does his first true love and all of that. It's important. It shapes a big part of who he is. And it also further sets up his fall when his world comes crashing down. Um, how much loss? This was one of the key questions I kept asking in developing Tony's character. How much extreme loss can one person endure in a fairly short time frame? without just losing it. And um, we put him to the test. <laughs> so yeah, two, the two primary field female characters, Diana when Tony is 18 and FBI agent Linda Monroe when he's 35, uh, they become very critical parts of the story and of his life. And as far as the romance goes, I wanted it to be um, real. I wanted, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hide anything that needed to be there to develop those relationships. I also didn't want to be too gratuitous. So there's, there's a certain fine line that we as authors, uh, I think, I hope try to walk. So I tried to walk that line and I will tell you that I, um, I started out being a little too mild in exposing those relationships. And I said, well, that's not, it's not working. It's got to be something more. And then I probably went a little too far and did get a, maybe a little too gratuitous at times. And so I said, no, I got to pull that back now. And so it took me a while to really find that, that what I ultimately decided was the happy middle ground. Um, so there are a few spicy points in there but I hope that they're not uh, overly um, gratuitous. I don't, I don't feel like they are. I felt like your, the romance scenes, it was poetic and a fade to black in a certain element. It's more maybe metaphorical at some points, so it didn't feel too uh, gratuitous. Yeah, certainly in his early years with the Diana, I, that's what I, I I tried to achieve. Yeah, because he was discovering love for the first time. So that's always a big deal for all of us. Well, it certainly is part of the hook to Tony and causing us to root for him and, and to go through the mystery. It's it's always fun to try and ask an author about a, a mystery book, because what what do we leave out in the interview? You know, so. We have a time frame that we're shifting between the 17 years. How did you make all of this best translate to a, a progressive revelation for the reader? Is there a way to talk about that without spoiling it for them? I think so. I, I think so. And I, it was obviously a challenge. Um, I finally decided that one of the things I needed to do for the reader was to keep them firmly clear about where they were at any point in time, what point in time they were in the story. And so I created chapter breaks, or perhaps if it was a very small break in time, section breaks within a chapter, where I indicate the day and the date that all of these things are happening. So, all they really have to do is pay attention to the chapter title and they know where they're at. Secondly, even though there are two separate time frames that we're moving the story forward in simultaneously, each of them progresses in order within their own time frame. So if there's two chapters from 1978, for example, and then two chapters from 1995, 
each of those two time frames are progressing in a linear fashion. And they each progress side by side, if you will, throughout the, the course of the book. And my hope was that as the tension and the mystery and the resolution built in one time frame, that that would feed everything that was happening in the other time frame. Um, so 1978 was, let's call it the foundational time frame. And 1995 was the ultimate resolutional time frame. But so 78 fed into 95, but they moved together in a way that made sense. So we would see, for example, what Tony Hooper was doing in 1978 related to a particular part of this story, and then how that uh, informed what he was doing in 1995, kind of in the in the same part of that story, finally coming to a resolution 17 years later. Um, I battled with that. I battled with it a lot. Um, and the reason ultimately that it probably took me three years of revision, I, I ultimately published what was the 26th version of this manuscript. So wow. it, was wow. a little, it was a little crazy, but um, I think the reason it took so long was precisely because that was difficult to pull off. And I'll be honest, I've had a couple of reviews where people said, oh, I got confused by the time jumping, but only a couple. And I, out of hundreds of, you know, reviews or feedback I've gotten, there's only been a couple of people that expressed uh, a disappointment with that. Everybody else said it worked seamlessly. So um, it's hard to do, but I, I spent a lot of time and energy on it. I recently listened to it. <clears throat> So that was my second time through. I did find that the second time through helped with the time progression, but I, it's been, I don't know, 15 years since I read uh, the first or whatever, whenever it came out. So um, I was relearning some things. I feel like it has a good reread value because it does present growth through the character in each of those scenes and some of those areas I didn't catch and appreciate as well the first time. Um, I think it's great. It's one of my favorite thrillers because it is it is so character focused and it does keep you in the suspense all the way to the end. So I hope that book two comes out quick because I'm eager to read it. You know, it's funny as we were, as I was preparing for our discussion here, I opened up book two of the manuscript and I took a look at it and I continued my, my self-editing where I had left off. Uh, got a couple more chapters edited. I'm reacquainting myself with the story and because it's been a while and I'm really determined somehow, some way to find the time to finish that thing this year. It's a, it's a challenge with my schedule, but uh, it's been too long and I desperately want to finish it. I mean, I'm 35,000 words into it, so I'm probably more than one third of the way through. And I have the whole thing outlined. So now it's just a matter of getting it done, finding the time. It's, it's difficult, but I'll get there. And um, it's been fun to revisit some of these characters because they've, they've become kind of important parts of my life. So, And frankly, you know, we didn't talk about when we we're talking about characters, one of the supporting characters that I get the most comments about is Frank Willow. And Frank Willow is an older gentleman who really uh, kind of takes Tony under his wing when everything uh, crashes and burns for Tony. And uh, Frank is uh, Frank is an important part of the story. So, and I had a lot of fun with him as well. Yeah, he's he's a spark and a surprise. So I can understand why you didn't maybe cover very much about him. Um, He's he's one that I think can really, well, as a side character, carry the series. He has some some background and uh, intrigue that I think will carry some more books. Yeah, um, he's also very very old. So, well, okay. 
So you killed him in the first chapter of book two. I get it. Whatever. No, I no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. But uh, you know, he's uh, he's a really really old guy, so he he can't go on forever. Um, but I've had probably thirty or forty people, either in reviews or in emails or notes or whatever, who've said, honestly, my favorite character in the book is Frank Willow. So it's like, wow, okay, I'll I'll take that. Yeah, I like Frank too. Uh, we just have a, a couple minutes, so just as the show host to give the audience some uh, context, we're going to have you back. We're going to talk a little bit through spoilers and have you share a little bit of your writing process. Um, okay, it's it's awesome to have you as an author uh, for readers, so they can check out your book and become fans like me. Uh, it's also a great resource to have you as the CEO of Evolve Publishing, editor, and uh, just looking forward to seeing behind the scenes on Pretty Me Alex. All right. So well, I look forward to it. Before that episode, um, anything you want to say about Forgive Me, Alex? Where can readers find it? How can they find you as an author? Well, I, you know, they can go to lanediamond.com. Uh, that's my personal website. They can also go to evolvedpub.com. That's our website for Evolve Publishing. The title of the book is Forgive Me, Alex. And it's easy to find at any of those sites. And, and you'll find there also links to any of the retailers, any of the formats you might be interested in uh, for the book. Um, it's um, the one constant complaint I have seemed to get, which is a bit of a double-edged sword. It's a complaint. So in that respect, it's a negative. But... It's also, depending on how you look at it, kind of a positive, and that is that people are complaining that I haven't given them the second book yet. So honestly, I'm I'm trying, I'm working on it. So I'm I'm making a little bit of progress and I hope to continue that process. And I hope that before the year is out, The Devil's Bane, which is the title of the second book, will be out. And just to sort of set the stage for folks, the devil is in my book, and forgive me, Alex, that's that's how Tony Hooper refers to Mitchell Norton, calls him the devil. And um, so that's, I think, a, a title that is well-earned by Mitchell Norton. Um, so I, yeah, I hope that's going to be, I hope that's, I hope I'll get that done this year. He's he's terrible, so I look forward to seeing whatever happens. Um, and I'm here to help you too, Dave. I'm here to encourage you, and and we'll we'll piece by piece our books together. That's what we got to do. We'll get it done. We'll get it done. I'm glad to hear you're getting back into your God's Knife series. That's great. I look I look forward to that progressing. Yes. Well, you've encouraged me, and I'm I'm trying to do the right thing. And uh, we were talking the other day just about story in general and character focused stories that involve publishing focus on the character motivations. And I, I had struggled as, in writing the sequel about what, what is the sequel gonna be about? <laughs> and it had been a few years since I'd written it, um, but you're just talking with you, it kind of eased my mind just think about the characters and what do they want? Like what, what are those characters excited about in the sequel? So since we, since we met, I started thinking about that and got some ideas. Yeah. And you mentioned the character focus in Forgive Me, Alex. And I think there's a character focus in a lot of Evolve Publishing's books, because honestly, as the person who's looking at submissions, what interests me most are the characters, the people. What, you know, why do we care about them? Why do we want to even know about their story? If we're honest about it, every story's been told. Most stories have been told a hundred times or a thousand times or 10,000 times. We try as authors to, or uh, creators, and this is true of, in movies or whatever it might be, to put a new twist on an old theme or an old story. 
And what is at the center of that? It's ultimately the people. It's like, okay, well, that story happened to somebody else, but this is happening to this guy. Well, what makes this guy special? Well, this is what makes him special. So you build the characters. And I think that's what brings people back over and over. When I think about, for example, Tom Clancy's books, it was Jack Ryan that got me hooked. I just wanted to know what was happening with Jack Ryan. Um, I think about Lee Child's whole Jack Reacher series. I don't, I don't know what he's up to now, 23, 24 books or whatever it is. I fell in love with the Jack Reacher character pretty early on. So I came back and read his books and read the next one and the next one and the next one. And at some point you can say, well, the stories are kind of similar, you know, but okay. But it's something new that's happening in this character's life. And I'm involved in that character. So I want to know about it. So for any authors, um, work on those characters, make the characters something special. And I think I can speak for readers out there that based on what we've heard from readers that, yeah, give us the characters, man. I love the characters. That's what it's all about. 